Good evening, I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, Novel Treatments for Bladder and Prostate Cancer in Pets with Dr. Chick Weiss. I'd like to take just a moment to let everyone know about our upcoming book club event on Wednesday, December 8th at 6 p.m. We'll feature a conversation with author Craig Grossi about his book, Craig and Fred. It's a beautiful story of a stray dog and a U.S. Marine who met under the unlikeliest of circumstances in Afghanistan and changed each other's lives forever. Uh, you can find more information about that event and our other future events, um, as well as links to register on our website at amcny.org slash events. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Chick Weiss completed his small animal surgical residency at the Veterinary Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He then pursued advanced training through a customized fellowship in interventional radiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He held dual appointments in surgery and radiology as an assistant professor at both the veterinary and human hospitals at the University of Pennsylvania before coming to the Animal Medical Center in 2009 as staff surgeon and head of the interventional radiology service. We are very grateful to have him with us to lead tonight's event. Uh, please welcome Dr. Chick Weiss. Thank you, Michelle and Kimberly, and I'd like to um, welcome you all tonight. Sorry, this couldn't be in person, but uh, I'm glad to be having the opportunity to speak to you. I want to thank the um, Ustan Institute for this opportunity um, about talking about bladder and prostate cancer in animals. We're mostly going to be talking about dogs, but most of what I say can be relayed um, to cats as well. It's just we just see that a lot less commonly, uh, this disease in cats. It's a little bit different, but um, as you'll see, I'll be focusing more on dogs. So I, I want to start by um, just giving you a little broad background and, and interventional radiology, which is, is some of the techniques we're going to be talking about tonight, is uh, basically the use of contemporary imaging modalities to use uh, uh, medical devices to gain access to different structures in order to deliver materials for therapeutic purposes. That's kind of the, the medical definition. But what it really is, is using image guidance to open up something that's inappropriately closed, like a tumor that's uh, uh, obstructing the urethra, so a, an animal or a patient can't urinate, or to close things that are inappropriately open, like taking away the blood supply to a tumor. And that's really what interventional radiology is. And this can be used throughout the whole body. And, and the body is really just a set of different tubes. And we can take advantage of that. There's blood vessels, there's the respiratory tract, the biliary tract, the urinary tract, the gastrointestinal tract. All these are, are series of tubes that we can gain access to and, and deliver some type of therapeutic devices. Interventional oncology is the use of these techniques for patients with cancer. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on tonight. Now, if hopefully you haven't had a, a, an animal with a bladder or prostate cancer, this is a very difficult cancer to treat, but um, if you've had animals with cancer, any type of cancer, one thing you may understand, unfortunately, is we, we do a lot worse of a job managing cancer in animals than, than they do in humans. And there's a, there's a, a number of reasons for this. Um, so, so we're just tend to be less successful. One is animals don't tend to show signs of cancer until it's pretty far spread. Um, that's just an evolutionary process. So we diagnose it much later in the disease and we don't have a lot of the targeted chemotherapeutic drugs and, and the finances and insurance to pay for a lot of these specific treatments. And, and clients are, are not really tolerant of um, a lot of the side effects from chemotherapy and, and radiation therapy. So in a person, if you say, you know, we're going to make you feel really sick for a couple of weeks and try and cure you of your cancer, you might be okay with that. But God forbid your dog gets really sick and is in the hospital for a week after chemotherapy, you're going to stop giving it chemo. So we give lower doses of less targeted drugs. Um, and, and that's part of the reason we don't have such good success. Um, and uh, it, it's not that clients are, and, and pet owners are not interested in, in helping their, their pets. They just don't want them to suffer. And these techniques I'm going to describe to you tonight allow 
us to have maybe better treatment options um, without being very invasive and causing a lot of complications. Historically, we were limited by equipment and patient size. Um, they need to be under general anesthesia and people, they, they do a lot of these procedures awake with a little bit of sedation. In animals, you know, they won't sit on the table, they won't breathe and hold and not move and stuff like that. So you have to um, put them under general anesthesia that adds cost and complexity and, and um, risk to the procedures. And, and a lot of the equipment we now have available for animals. There was also a lack of technology and training, but now a lot of us have been trained in these techniques and, and we have the opportunity to, uh, to treat these patients. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit as we go through the, the principles of interventional oncology. And we're gonna talk about a couple different things we can do. One is palliative stenting. That's where we put these little, usually metallic or plastic tubes to hold things open that are obstructed by cancer. Like someone who has a coronary obstruction, a heart, a blood vessel obstruction, and they get a little stent to hold it open. We can do that as well. Um, local delivery of chemotherapy instead of throughout the whole body, that's called intraarterial chemotherapy. Embolization, where we take the blood supply away to a tumor, um, and then some future treatments, some combination surgery, interventional treatments, tumor ablations, and things uh, of that nature. The first thing um, I'll just mention is, is if you start researching this, though, there's a lot of different confusing terminology. And the first is transitional cell carcinoma, which is what you'll hear me say probably just out of habit. And a lot of your doctors will say that, vets. And TCC is what we call, these are the cells that line the urinary tract. More recently, it's been changed in the veterinary side to invasive ure urothelial carcinoma. So you may see that, and those are pretty much the same thing. And the reason is because you may look up treatments for people with TCC, and in people, TCC is very different. It tends to be very superficial. 95% of the cases are superficial. You could laser it off, put chemo in the bladder, and these people can be treated for many, many years very um, effectively. And about 5% of humans you get what's called a muscle invasive type of TCC. And that doesn't respond to any of those traditional therapies. And they actually take your whole bladder out if you have that. And unfortunately for us, dogs get invas muscle invasive TCC probably uh, 90 plus 95% of the time when we diagnose it. So um, it, it, it just helps us understand the different nature of this when we compare it to humans. It is similar to humans, but it's, in, it's similar to the rare invasive form in people. The other thing is you may talk to different doctors and say, oh, this is what you should do, this is what you do, and, and, and you get a lot of different um, suggestions, but really it depends on a lot of things. The location of the tumor, the gender, male and female are gonna be different, the stage, where it is throughout the body as it's metastasized, the grade, that's what the cells look like under um, a microscope to see how aggressive the cancer is. Other things too, these are all going to affect what is recommended. And that's why you don't just go, what do you do if my animal has TCC? It's very different on a, a whole number of range. Like everything, it's more complicated the more you learn about it. I'll also mention that prostate cancer is not the same as TCC. Maybe 80% of the time it's a transitional cell carcinoma, but about 20% of the time it's a primary tumor of the prostate, a carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma of the prostate. And that we treat them similarly. But, but when we compare results, we're mixing two different cancers and that can make it a little difficult. So the, the, when the tumor's in the prostate, it tends to have a worse prognosis. Just some general things when I see a case and I talk to my, my pet owners, I say the first thing you need to do is make sure you have a medical oncologist. The medical oncologist is the foreman of the job. They tend to understand chemotherapy. They understand what the radiation oncologist can do. They understand what the surgical oncologist can do. Some of them may understand what the interventional oncologist can do, but most don't because this is relatively new. But they kind of get a sense of all the different options and put all of this stuff together. So it's very good to have a medical oncologist involved. For me, when I'm speaking to someone, it's very important I understand the client and what their expectations are. It's often more important that I know what the client wants, the pet owner wants, than, than what's going on with the pet and the tumor. I need to know what their goals are. You know, or do you want um, to try and cure this disease and do everything possible? Or do you just want to maintain a good quality of life, not cause any problems, be very risk averse? Because in general, the more 
aggressive we are at treating cancer, the, the higher risk there is of having a complication, but also the higher likelihood that we can achieve better outcomes. So that's a balance. Um, also, what are the resources, not just financial resources, but um, is the, and, and the daily structure, you know, do you have a support group, um, you, know, you have family to help you with all this, because a lot of this is labor intensive. Does the patient go to the, the dog, do they go to work with you? Do you work from home and can, can be with your dog and see it all the time, change diapers if they're incontinent, or are you at work 12 hours a day and you travel a lot and don't live with anybody? Um, that makes our, our discussion about what we're going to do different. If we're going to cause incontinence and the dog sleeps with you every night in the bed and you have white carpet um, and little kids around and their you know, urine with chemotherapy is leaking out, that's different than if your dog lives outside and, and you don't care if they're incontinent. So all of this really makes a big difference. And we'll talk about comorbidities, gender and, and size, how that affects our discussions also. In the beginning, we really want to make one decision is, do we want to try and cure this? And I have that in italics because a lot of people don't believe you can cure this disease. And that may be the case in most cases. Or do we not want to be very aggressive and just provide a good quality of life? And it's best to figure that out early. Another thing I like to remind people is, is everyone has a story how a doctor said your animal was going to live this long, three months, and it lived a year and a half. Or they said it was going to live two years and it lived one month. No one ever knows how long your dog is going to live or your cat. No, no one can predict the future. What they're talking about is median survival times. Median survival times are obtained by evaluating a treatment in a group of animals. And like everything else, it tends to be like a bell curve. So when we're comparing two treatments, we're looking at two different bell curves. And the median survival is in each of those different groups of patients and the median is the middle. So half live longer than that, and half live shorter than that. So when we talk about non-steroidal drugs, which is one of the common things we treat this, this cancer with, if we just use non-steroidal drugs and nothing else, the median survival is about six months, meaning your dog's not gonna live six months. It means that if you just do non-steroidals, there's a 50% chance your dog will live longer than 60 month, six months and a 50% chance it will live shorter than six months. We don't know how long your dog's going to live, but when we compare it to studies that looked at chemotherapy and non-steroidal drugs, the median survival there is 12 months. That does not mean your dog is going to live twice as long if you give it chemotherapy. That means if you look at two populations of animals, one that got NSAIDs and one got NSAIDs in chemotherapy, the group that got NSAIDs in chemotherapy as a group tended to live longer your dog might not live very long, or your dog might live incredibly long on just NSAIDs alone. So no one can predict what's gonna happen with your dog. With radiation therapy, external beam radiation, I'm not gonna talk about that much today, but um, median survival times may be in the year, two year range. It's not really clear. There's not a lot of papers out there. Surgery, very little known about surgery, and we'll talk about that. The urinary tract anatomy. We're going to be talking about this. There's going to be some graphic surgical pictures. If any of you are queasy about blood, I'll try and remember to warn you before it comes up. But um, what you need to know is we have the kidneys that make the urine. Then the urine comes down the ureters. It goes into the bladder, urinary bladder, where it's stored. And then when you're ready to urinate, it comes out the urethra. This is a female dog with the uterus right above here. And there's a pelvis right under here. This is a male dog where we have the ureters coming in, here's the bladder, here's the prostate, much longer urethra in the male dog. And here's the pelvis again, not a lot of room to work in here unless you cut open the pelvis, the rectum and colon are right over here. They're right up on top of here also. This is the trigone. You may hear people talking about the trigone, tri for three, the two ureters and the urethra come together right here. This is where these tumors often occur. And that's very difficult because that causes problems with the ureters and the urethra. It's much better when it occurs over at the apex of the bladder. Here's a graphic picture of a bladder. I hope you're okay with this, but this is a, a dog in surgery, the urethra, and this is the urinary bladder, and this is cancer in the trigone. The ureters are coming in here and are obstructed. And what we used to do is try and cut out this cancer the best we could and reattach the ureters up into the apex of the bladder surgically 
And we don't tend to do that anymore because we leave so much tumor behind. If you have a one centimeter cubic tumor and you take 99.9% .9 of that tumor out, you leave a billion cancer cells left. Okay, so to just try and carve this out and assume you're making a big difference is unlikely. But what you'll see here is that the majority of the dogs with invasive urothelial carcinoma um, develop local problems, straining to urinate, blood in the urine. And that's one of the major causes of death in these patients. You know, you think your dog's got a urinary tract infection, someone tells you they have cancer and they have limited survival times or they can't pee all of a sudden, and then you find out it's cancer, it's a big surprise. What can we do? Well, if they're having difficulty urinating, we can put a stent in, we could put a tube in the bladder. This is just a catheter that goes into the bladder if they, if they can't urinate out the urethra. A lot of people are not interested in managing a dog or a cat with a tube sticking out of it, okay? So one of the other things that's been reported is the UGA lab procedure. This is laser ablation. This is based on a human procedure where they go in and scope and they see the tumor and they laser out the tumor. Now, this is not used in humans for muscle invasive TCC because it doesn't really change the prognosis. That's why we personally don't do this very often because we're dealing with muscle invasive TCC. Additionally, a study where they opened the bladder and lasered out the tumor showed no difference in survival with dogs just getting chemotherapy alone. So to do a surgery, if they live basically the same length of time as, as chemotherapy, is probably not indicated. Now they did say they had fewer clinical signs, less difficulty urinating and things, and that's great. And you can use this for that, but we could also use stents for that. What is a stent? Well, to put a stent in, here's a male dog, Here's the penis and the prep use right here. And we're putting a guide wire in. And then this little catheter goes over the guide wire, sits into the tip of the penis. And then we have a guide wire going up the urethra and into the bladder. And here's what a urethrogram looks like. So the dog's pelvis is here and legs. This is contrast in the urinary bladder. This is a prostate tumor. And this is contrast in the urethra showing that the urethra is very wide here and then gets very narrow here. And this dog's straining to urinate because this is all cancer right here and it's occluding the urethra. We have these stents that are loaded on these delivery systems. It's a little metal stent in here. And as you unsheath the stent, as you pull this little plastic cover back, the stent expands and is deployed inside the urethra. This is a video of what it looks like when we deploy one of these. So here's a urethrogram. We see nice normal urethra, and then it gets very narrow here coming up to the bladder. This is tumor in here in the bladder. And this is all just a big tumor. And this is the stent on the delivery system. And we've measured it. Here's normal urethra, and then it gets very narrow here all the way up to here. And that's the stent. So we're gonna unsheath the stent. And as we unsheath it, what you're gonna see is start to expand. And all these videos are on our website. There's the stent expanding and we're just pulling the sheath back. This is all done through the, through the penis or the, or the urethra, the vulva of the female. So there's no surgery. There's no incision for any of this. And this is opening up. We can see we keep deploying, it's all open. And this is the entire process of deploying the stent. It's, that's the same speed as it occurs. It's a very fast procedure. And we repeat the urethrogram and we can see now it's open. If you were going to do endoscopy on this patient, you'd see the urethra is filled with tumor here. And then after the stent, it's just holding the tumor open to allow the patient to urinate. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but um, obstruction, putting a stent in, this was our paper years ago, where 41 out of 42, we completely relieved the obstruction with the stent. And incontinence. There is a risk of incontinence when you put a stent in the urethra. Um, and it turns out it's about one in four animals. One in four dogs will be incontinent after a stent. That means they just drip urine all the time. Severe incontinence, one in four dogs. Three in four dogs, so three out of four females and three out of four males will either be totally continent or mildly incontinent, meaning they drip a little bit of urine before and after urination, but not in between. So 75% of male and female dogs will be what we call pet quality, meaning that, you know, they might drip a little bit or pee normally, whereas 25%
will be completely incontinent and may need diapers. So it's important that people understand that. And we've done some research looking at the length of the obstruction here in the urethra, um, the length of the actual tumor, the diameter of the tumor, the length of the functional portion of the urethra here to maintain continence and found no correlation between the length of the tumor, the diameter of the tumor, the location of the tumor and the likelihood of incontinence. Keep in mind when we talk about treating cancer, we treat it locally and we treat it systemically, right? So chemotherapy goes throughout your whole body but also might shrink the tumor locally. Radiation treats locally but not the rest of the body because we're focusing a beam of radiation on the tumor. Surgery, we're just dealing with the tumor. We're not treating systemically. Same with the stent. We're just opening this tumor locally, but we're not treating the rest of the body and this tumor can spread. So if we just put a stent in, median survival was only about two to three months. That's not very good. But if we continued chemotherapy and non-steroidal drugs, it was more like eight months median survival. Now you might say, well, certain NSAIDs in chemo is a year. Yes, but this is after they failed all of that. This is very aggressive disease when you can't even urinate anymore. So once you fail chemotherapy long enough and then your tumor grows and you can't urinate, you can still get a median survival of eight months beyond that. Half live longer, half live shorter. Get a lot of calls about putting urethral stents in. And you have to understand that when, you when animals have bladder tumors or urethral tumors, they may strain to urinate. That doesn't mean they're obstructed. So we need to differentiate an animal that goes out, empties its bladder, and then keeps posturing to pee. That's an animal that feels irritation from the tumor, maybe an infection or whatever. A, a stent isn't going to help that animal if they have an empty bladder. That's as opposed to an animal that goes out and strains to pee and still has a full bladder. That patient will benefit from a stent. So it's important we understand that because if you put a stent in the first animal that had an empty bladder, you might just make them incontinent. You're not going to help them. So we, we, um, that's important to know. And sometimes the incontinence improves over the first week. The, str the straining to urinate can improve. And we strongly encourage chemotherapy in these patients. And they go home the same day. They don't even stay in the hospital overnight. Now we can also do this in the ureter. The ureter, um, if the ureter gets obstructed with tumor and the kidney gets very dilated, that's what we're seeing here is a dilated kidney. The, the urine made in the kidney can't empty into the bladder and it fills with urine. And this is what a big dilated kidney looks like. So with an, a little needle, we poke a needle with ultrasound into the kidney through the body wall. And then we pass a guide wire down the ureter into the bladder under fluoroscopy. This is the video x-ray. And then we pass it out the urethra is what we call dog on a wire or flossed. So this dog has a wire going completely through it and coming out the urethra. Then what we can do is pass a stent over the guide wire. This is a plastic stent. And that stent sits in the kidney, comes down the ureter. It's got multiple holes in it. And we push it into the bladder. You can see the tumor right here. And all through a needle stick in the body wall, we now unobstruct this kidney. So this dog can go home that night, usually, with just a little hole, doesn't even need pain medicine. And now that kidney's unobstructed, they can go on to continue to receive their non-steroidal drugs and the chemotherapy. So we're talking right now about um, how, we, uh, how we basically um, open something that's inappropriately closed. Now we're going to talk about something different. If you've ever seen gotten chemotherapy or seen someone get chemotherapy or dog, what happens is you, you choose, your doctor chooses a dose of chemotherapy, which is really a poison. It's a poison to rapidly dividing cells. And we're limited how much we can give because if you give it through the whole body, it's gonna to get to your bone marrow and your gut rapidly dividing cells. And then you have to wait a couple of weeks for those cells to, to recover from that damage, okay? We can't give higher doses of chemotherapy or you'll cause too much toxicity to the patient. So how do we give more chemotherapy to the tumor without giving it to the patient? So if you give chemotherapy into a vein, you've figured out this toxic dose, you give it into the vein, 
It goes back to the heart, getting diluted with all the blood going back to the heart. Then it goes to the lungs, the first capillary bed. Then it goes back to the heart. Then it gets pumped throughout your whole body. A little bit gets to your bladder tumor, your prostate tumor. Now the idea and the rest of it goes throughout your whole body and goes to your gut and your bone marrow. Intraarterial therapy is instead of going in the vein, we go in an artery in the neck or the groin, and we bring that catheter down to the blood supply to the tumor, and we give that entire systemic dose of chemotherapy directly into the tumor. So the tumor sees an undiluted full dose of chemotherapy. And then as it drains through the body, the same dose of it was given intravenously would go to the gut and the bone marrow. So we, we get a much higher dose to the, to the organs we're treating. And in, in animal models, they showed eight times the concentration or more in these organs. So it's giving like eight times the dose of chemotherapy that you could give intravenously. And we could bring these catheters down to these organs. And I'm just going to show you a video here. This is a catheter in the aorta of a dog. You give an injection, and these are the iliac arteries, external and internal iliac arteries. These external iliac arteries go to the limbs. So here's the pelvis. These internal iliac arteries go to the organs inside the pelvis, like the urogenital tract. This is a one millimeter catheter. Okay, so it feels like a thick piece of hair. And then we look in a lateral view and a side view. And then this is the blood supply, the internal iliac artery. And what you'll see is there's this is a female, so this is the vaginal artery coming down to the caudal vesicle artery. This is going to the bladder. This part's going to the vagina and the urethra. And we can take this one millimeter catheter with a wire that's small enough to fit inside it. And we're aiming the angle on this wire to, to aim down, we could twist it to get into this vessel and come right down to this tiny little vessel. Then we feed the catheter over this. And then we take the entire body's dose of chemotherapy and deliver it directly into the bladder and the urethra, the tumor itself, rather than giving this whole dose throughout the whole body, okay? Now this dog had a bladder tumor that was removed and then um, it grew back. And we'll give an injection right here. This is going to the bladder and you can actually see the bladder here. This is all the tumor of the bladder, all this blood supply going here. So we give the systemic dose directly into that, okay? And we've done a couple studies on this. One showed in, this, in this two groups of dogs, the ones that got the intraarterial chemotherapy had greater decreases in the tumor size, had more likely to have um, partial remissions or stable disease. That means the tumor stayed the same size or got smaller. Whereas the dogs that got the intravenous chemo were more likely um, to have progressive disease. We didn't see growth of the tumor in any of the intraarterial dogs. Additionally, the intraarterial dogs had fewer side effects from the chemotherapy. Now it's expensive to put these animals under anesthesia and do this, so it costs money to do this. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks, but we think we may get better results. We did a follow-up study where we measured systemic chemotherapy levels after each dog got either an intraarterial dose or an intravenous dose. And we showed when they get the same chemotherapy dose intraarterially, less of it is measured systemically. And if it's the same dose, that means more of it is in the tumor. And that's what we want to see. So in general, we've shown that we could deliver chemotherapy throughout the body, high doses locally, and perhaps get better results and fewer side effects. Will that affect survival? We don't know, but it's certainly nice to see that that happens. Now, the next step of getting into the blood supply of the tumor is taking the blood supply of the tumor away. The blood supply is what maintains this liver tumor being, uh, this bladder tumor being alive. And this is what we do in liver tumors in dogs and what they do in people. But now we've started doing it in the prostate. And that's happened uh, in people too, for benign prostatic hyperplasia. This was one of our former fellows in our IR service, Dr. Bill Culp, who's at UC Davis now. He just published a study on prostatic embolization in dogs with prostate tumors. And what they showed prospectively is they took 20 dogs with prostate tumors, and they had signs of straining to defecate, straining to urinate in seven out of nine dogs, and nine out of ten, or in seven, in nine and ten dogs. Nine were straining to defecate, ten were straining to urinate. And then they embolized them. 
and the straining to defecate and straining to urinate resolved in seven and nine dogs respectively. So almost all of them improved. When they looked at the size of the tumor, the median, meaning half more and half less, 40% shrinkage of the prostate. That's amazing. We don't ever see that really with chemotherapy. So that's huge, huge uh, advancement here. And here's just showing a case we did. Here's a CT scan. This is a, a spine right here. This is the bladder. This is the prostate tumor. Here's the pelvis right here. And this is the urethra coming down. That's the bladder tumor. And this tumor is going up into the trigone, partially obstructing a ureter. We're at the aorta again. So we have the external iliacs going to the legs, the internal iliacs going down um, to the inside of the pelvis. Here's our catheter. This is a male dog. So instead of the vaginal, this is the prostatic artery. And this is the prostate. This is about a, you know, three centimeter prostate. And we could bring this catheter right down into the blood supply of the prostate. And you can see how it stains with the contrast. Then we embolize it with these little beads through this catheter. We give an injection. And now hopefully you can appreciate that we're not seeing the contrast go here anymore. Little bits getting around, still going to the bladder and the urethra, but very much less is getting to the actual prostate because these little beads are obstructing the blood flow at the capillary level to the prostate. Then we back the catheter up and do it on the other side of the prostate. So this is the other half of the prostate. The prostate's in the midline of the, of the uh, patient. So we have a blood supply coming from both sides. And we could see again, the other side of the prostate, you can see all this blood supply and staining of the prostate. After we embolize it, we repeat the angiogram again. And again, you can see we've taken almost all the blood supply away from this prostate, okay? In, in one treatment, this is a one treatment thing as opposed to chemo, which we keep doing. And a month postoperatively, this tumor had shrunk by 30% uh, of its volume. And the mass that was in the trigone obstructing the ureter had retracted um, and decreased the obstruction of the ureter. So really encouraging information with prostate embolization. Um, so a lot more work needs to be done in, in here, but certainly this is something that's going to be uh, performed more and more in the future. I'll just say one more thing on ablation. There's different devices that use thermal ablation or alcohol ablation or microwave ablation or ultrasound ablation, very focused ultrasound waves that you can put on the prostate transrectally. And you can use um, ultrasound, high frequency ultrasound to actually ablate the prostate. This was done in normal dogs as in research in 1996. And now we are revisiting this now to see about um, ultrasound ablation for prostates in dogs. The last thing I want to talk about is surgery. There's going to be some graphic pictures here a little bit, but I want to talk about surgery. And if you look at the data, it's very confusing. Some suggest that there's help with surgery. Some suggest there is not help with surgery. And instead of going through all these, I just want to explain a little bit about how a surgeon thinks about this disease. Now, a lot of people feel this isn't a surgical disease. And I'm not sure if that's the case, but I'll explain. You'll hear things like a partial cystectomy. Cystectomy, re, re, uh, cystectomy refers to removal of the bladder, partial or total. A partial cystectomy is taking part of the bladder away. Total cystectomy is taking the total bladder out, okay? If you have a tumor here at the apex of the bladder, away from the trigone, a partial cystectomy is relatively straightforward. You can cut out this part of the bladder, suture it back together, you don't interfere with anything, okay? Now, a total cystectomy in a female dog would be taking out the entire bladder and urethra, okay? And the end of the ureters. So these ureters have to be put somewhere. We'll put them in the vagina or the uterus or something, but then you have an incontinent dog. You have no place for urine to collect, so they just drip urine all the time. A total cystectomy in a male dog would involve, because a male has a long urethra here, is we would maybe take out the prostate as well, maybe not, depending on where the tumor was. But these tr transitional cells tend to repopulate the urinary tract very quickly. So even if you take out part of the tumor, we always see the tumor come back. 
And that's why doing more radical surgeries may be better. You can see with the pelvis right here, it's very difficult to do surgery. Here's gonna be a, a, a gory picture if you can tolerate it. This is a male dog. This is from a publication where the bladder was removed. So there's no bladder here anymore. This is one ureter with the catheter coming out. This is another ureter with the catheter coming out. And this is the urethra where the bladder has been removed. And here's the pelvis. So you don't have much room to work here. You can't take much of this urethra out. You have to suture these two ureters together and then suture them back to the urethra here. So it's kind of complicated. This can leak, it can get strictured. Is a partial cystectomy worth it? A lot of people don't want to take out the whole bladder and have an incontinent dog. So the question is, is taking out part of the bladder worth it? And we were part of a multi-institutional study that compared animals getting chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy, chemotherapy and non-steroidals alone or chemotherapy and non-steroidals and a partial cystectomy. And what they showed was that in this study, what we showed is that it, it made a, uh, they, they lived a little bit longer if, if, if the surgery was done, but it wasn't really significant because the tumor grew back at the same rate. So whether you did surgery or not, the tumor progressed. And let me explain that. Animals included in the partial cystectomy tended to have tumors up here where you could do a partial cystectomy. But the animals that did not get a partial cystectomy tended to have tumors near the trigone. These animals die sooner because they can't urinate. So they get euthanized. You take this out, the tumor grows back, but the tumor takes a while to spread up and down the urethra and the ureters, so they live longer, probably not because of the surgery, but because of the original location of the tumor. Some people will still recommend surgery for these, others will not. Really depends on who you're talking to. I'm not sure what the right answer is, but in that multi-institutional study, I know a lot of the oncologists and surgeons on the paper agree that it may not be worthwhile doing this. You also risk spreading cancer to the body uh, throughout the abdomen and stuff, so it's, it's risky. For radical surgery, that's taking out the whole prostate gland and urethra or taking out the whole bladder. And the results have not been very good. Now, if you look at total cystectomy, taking out the whole bladder in dogs for TCC, dehiscence or breakdown of the surgical sites. This is in 10. Two of them had breakdown of the sites. Three of them had chronic urinary tract infections. Two of them stopped producing urine and, and died. One of them had high uh, renal values and one had a ureteral obstruction. This is, this is a lot of issues. Um, and the median survival was about a year. And that's what we get with chemotherapy and non-steroidals and no, and no surgery, right? So it's a little difficult to, to recommend this to people. However, one or two of these animals might be cured from the disease and which are the ones that we're gonna benefit. For prostatectomy, for prostate tumors, median survival, about eight months. Again, you go, well, that's not better than chemo or NSAIDs. Why even bother doing it? Well, 10% or 12% of these dogs, so maybe two dogs or so, were alive at two years. That's pretty good with just Kibo and NSAIDs for a prostate tumor. So some of these dogs, some certain animals may benefit from having this done. There are some papers not to spend a lot of time on, on animals that have lost their bladders for other reasons besides TCC, and some of them can live for years. So it's not just the, the bladder surgery, it's the TCC that limits their survival. We started doing this surgery a while back, and this was a dog that came to us, a beagle, had a lot of tumor in its bladder, bilateral kidney obstructions, very sick from its um, ureteral obstructions. And we used a device that we use in cats with ureteral obstructions, it, which, which makes the surgery easier. That's basically a catheter goes in the kidney and a catheter goes in the bladder. And instead of trying to resuture the ureters back to the urethra and all this stuff, we just put these tubes in instead. And this is what it looks like. We took the bladder and prostate out here and instead of leaving urethra right up to the pelvis right here, we were able to reach in and cut the urethra all the way back here. Now, we never would have been able to suture the ureters back there. It's too far away. But because we didn't have to worry about suturing the ureters back together, we just ligated them, sutured them, closed, put catheters in the kidneys and another catheter in the prepuce, and we get a bigger um, excision of the tumor 
and a lot fewer of the complications of surgery. And afterwards, the kidneys are nice and decompressed um, and the creatinine drops. Now, this was not a curative intent. This was a palliation and the dog only lived three months, but it didn't die from its urinary obstruction. We can do this in females too. Here's the urethra, the bladder, and the ureters. And we can take the whole urethra and bladder out, which if we're really trying to stop the TCC from growing back, that partial cystectomy, the tumor always grows in the other transitional cells of the bladder and the urethra. So we need to take the whole lower urinary tract out. Then when we do that, we have the catheters in the kidneys and the catheter goes in the vagina. And this is what it looks like. We could have this little port to sample. We could put contrast in and show kidney, kidney, and this is just going out um, the urethra here. Now, doing this surgery allowed us to get very wide excisions and get almost you know, clean margins of tumor. Now you still have to treat radiation maybe or chemotherapy to treat systemically. The, the nodes or systemic disease with chemo and NSAIDs. But what we found is when these dogs were incontinent from not having a bladder, that infections was one of a, the problems. And this is where it comes into patient size. When we have little dogs, you have a three kilo dog, an eight pound dog, that dog is incontinent. You can put a diaper on him or her and change it every six hours. If you have a 90 pound lab that's incontinent, they produce a ton of urine and you're gonna be changing the diaper every hour. And that's a lot for people. And if they're constantly leaking, they're gonna get infections if they're not kept clean. And that led to this development of an artificial bladder. Now this is using that device I showed you with the catheters and the kidneys going into an artificial bladder that sits in the abdomen, and then it goes out to a tube in the body wall. And we developed this such that now you have a tube coming out, but there's no bladder or urethra, and a couple times a day, you drain the urine out. Not having the incontinence helps reduce the risk of infections, okay? But again, this requires an owner who wants to deal with the tube, okay? Now, if we can cure this disease and you're left with a tube, that's one thing. But if we do all this and we still can't cure the disease, is it worth doing this? And that's really what we don't know yet because we've done too few cases. Here was one of the first cases we did, huge bladder tumor and a dog came in, it was uh, kidneys were obstructed, put in the artificial bladder. This dog actually lived for 12 months afterwards, still had tumor left because it was just a palliation, it was in the urethra. Um, had two infections that cleared because you can put disinfectant in this artificial bladder to clear infections. So in certain animals, this may be a good thing to do or a reasonable thing to do. It's certainly not something that's for everybody. It really depends a lot on the client. They need to be available. You can't just go away for two days and not drain your dog's bladder. Males tend to have fewer infections than females because we leave some of that urethra left. So in male dogs, we're more likely to just take everything out. We're gonna do surgery and not put an artificial bladder in um, because they tend to be more um, uh, resistant to infections in the females. Um, and larger dogs tend to get more infections. So larger dogs may be more inclined to consider a neobladder because we can control infections. Whereas small dogs, small male dogs, we think might just be fine without that. Big female dogs, may be more likely to consider something like a neobladder. But again, very early stage is not commercially available. This is all in the research stage. So we have discussed some of the principles of onco interventional oncology, how it works, what it is, the equipment involved. We've talked about stenting for obstructions to the urethra or the ureter to allow a patient to urinate and let them go on to continue to receive medical therapy or radiation to, to help keep the tumor at bay. We've talked about local delivery of chemotherapy to avoid systemic doses. We still get chemo go systemically, but when we give it locally into the artery, we get super systemic levels of chemotherapy into the tumor. And why we might not see some of the good effects of the chemotherapy we use in dogs, maybe because of the lower doses we use compared to humans and the inability to get high levels to the tumor. This allows us to use the limited chemotherapies we have available to get much higher levels to the tumor. It's, it requires anesthesia each time, 
Um, and there's ports and things you could try. So there's other ways around this, but this is, I think, promising for certain cases. We've talked about embolization. That's where we inject the particles to take the blood supply away to the prostate. Not routinely doing that or, or doing that for regular TCC in the bladder. We worry about damaging some other structures of the bladder and things in the urethra. But for the prostate, it certainly seems like it's a promising opportunity. Chemoembolization is actually mixing arterial chemo and embolization. That's probably the next step. So we get high levels of chemo staying in the tumor, but there is risk of just necrosis and leakage and stuff like that. We also talked about tumor ablation with ultrasound and other devices to ablate the tissues. And there's combination therapies of arterial chemo with radiation to sensitize the tumor. Um, surgery followed by radiation and chemotherapy. So there's a lot of different opportunities here to see what we can do. So I know that's a lot to take in all at once. Um, imagine if this was your dog that just got um, diagnosed and you hear all of this stuff in an, in an exam room in 15 minutes. So um, hopefully this will be a resource. If you have any friends that have patients, or pets that are diagnosed with this, you can um, send them to this video so they could at least get a background on some of the interventional things. Now, this is not all inclusive. We didn't cover everything that's done for TCC. We just barely breezed over chemotherapy, breezed over radiation. Those are the mainstays of treatment for a lot of this disease, but these are some of the newer things coming down the line. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your time this evening. And I think we have a couple minutes for some questions. Yes. Uh Thank you so much. This is a terrific presentation. It's just really fascinating to see all of the work you're doing and all the advancements in veterinary medicine. It's, and as you mentioned to everyone, we will have this posted tomorrow because I know it is a lot to take in, but you can watch it at a slower pace and, and, and share it if you'd like. Um, so th thank you again. Um, yes, we have a few questions. Um, let's see, how, how many sessions are used in intra-arterial chemo? Is there? That's a great question. So you can use intra-arterial chemotherapy every three weeks, just like intravenous chemotherapy, but it's expensive to do that. You're probably looking about $2,000 a treatment because they have to be under general anesthesia. We have to use these special catheters and things like that. So what we tend to do in some of the dogs that we've treated every three weeks, we've seen nice reduction locally of the disease, but some of the systemic disease has gotten bigger than lymph nodes or metastases, because we're really mostly treating locally. So um, what, what we're doing is we tend to treat intravenously, and then three weeks later, intraarterially, then three weeks later, intravenously, then three weeks intraarterially. So we tend to alternate therapies. And that way it takes, dog gets a break, so they're not under anesthesia every three weeks, and we can treat systemically, and then more locally, and systemically and more locally. So you could just alternate treatments. Right. Okay. Um, you may have um, gone over this, but it just with the intraarterial um, chemo, it is it used for prostate cancer? Yeah, you did. Yep. Yeah. That's okay. Um, let's see. Do you use any of thing, the supply? Uh, the I'm other sorry, thing I just mentioned about the intraarterial therapy is you can also give non-steroidal drugs intraarterially. Okay. So. We could get high doses of the, the non-steroidal drugs locally into the tumor as well. And those have been shown to be some of the best things. And NSAIDs have been one of the strongest responses of, of these tumors to NSAIDs even more so than chemo. So we can mix them together and give them both intraarterially. Okay, wow. Um, okay, does any of this apply to a mammary mass with adenocarcinoma in guinea pigs? Have you been using this in other species? Um, well, guinea pigs, we haven't done any intraarterial. We've done some interventions on them, but not intraarterial because their vessels are so very, very small. And for mammary masses, resection is usually what we would consider. Surgery. Okay. Mm -hmm. If okay. you can do surgery, I, one thing I just want to mention, the treatments I've basically talked to you tonight, everything except surgery is palliative, meaning we, we try and provide a good quality of life as long as we can, but it's not curative. We're not going to give so much chemo intraarterially that the tumor goes away and never comes back. So we cure more cancer with surgery than we do with chemotherapy and radiation therapy combined. It's the same in humans for, for gross disease. 
mass disease that you can touch, you know, not like liquid tumors, like, you know, leukemias and stuff. We don't do surgery for that. But, but if you can take the tumor out, that's the best thing for most of the cancer we're talking about. So in these cases, it's, it's not operable. And, right. and, a guinea, and a guinea pig with, guinea yeah, pig, I mean, yeah. and a guinea pig, if you could operate, that's probably the best thing to do. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, for radiation therapy, is there any MST for the different types of treatments, SRT, IMRT, palliative, et cetera? Yeah, so that's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture. Yeah. There's a lot <laughs> we do of have different some chemos. veterinarians here, I think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but in general, with chemo, most people, and says the, the general rule of thumb is with non steroidals alone, you look at six month median survivals. With chemotherapy and NSAIDs, you're probably looking at 12 months, 10 to 16 months, somewhere in there, median survivals. Radiation, hard to know. There's only a couple papers out there. There's some concerns. Some of the papers are a little strange the way they've done stuff, but probably one to two year median survivals, different for prostate. When you look at stereotactic radiosurgery or IMRT, not a lot of information out on those yet, if that's going to change things or not. Okay. Um, there's a question. Um, has the industry seen a difference in survival rates across those diagnosed after having symptoms of prostate cancer and those for whom it was found, I guess, an incidental finding? Does that make a difference? Um, that, is, that is a good question. And one of the radiation papers I was just talking about, like half the cases were, had no clinical signs. And um, that's very uncommon in my practice to see a dog with a tumor that has no clinical signs, a urinary tract tumor. Um, so it would seem that getting to these tumors earlier would be helpful. And that's why there's some screening tests done in Westies, um, with the new BRAF test, the BRAF test, which is a urine test. You could get your patient screened for this. It's not, it's not 100%, but it's certainly... Um, there's good screening tests available for those and, and um, Shelties and maybe Beagles that are high risk for this type of tumor. Um, so certainly screening protocols can be very helpful. If we could diagnose these early, um, yes, I think you will have a better chance with all of the therapies we've discussed. Okay, great. Um, uh, Susan, I know you have been having some audio issues, but um, hopefully you can hear. Um, she's asking about paroxicam in veins. So you may have so mentioned paroxicam that. does not come in an injectable form, at least in the United States. I don't know if it does elsewhere, but meloxicam is similar to paroxicam. Rimadil, um, those are drugs that do come in liquid injectable forms, so we can use some of those. Um, I'm not aware of uh, injectable paroxicam. In a, a, you could make it. You could compound it orally but not as an injectable in a vessel to my knowledge. Are these, let's see, are these results and in treatments transferable oh, someone, to cats? So, someone just wrote even orally will paroxicam help. Well, yes, paroxicam okay, yeah. is a non-steroidal drug. So paroxicam yes. is the first drug that was identified um, to be used for, for TCC. So you, absolutely, that's yes. one of the first lines. That's the, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, paroxicam. Yes, okay. that's what we would commonly use. Great. Cats, many of this is similar. Cat TCC tends to be much slower growing than dogs and slower to metastasize. So mm -hmm. cats, you can often have lived for years with TCC. That's pretty okay. uncommon um, in, in, in dogs to live as long as cats with TCC. And yes, the paroxicam, if it's working, I just saw you texted, um, you chatted, mm -hmm. uh, you give it the whole time the tumor is there for the rest of their life as long as they tolerate it. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we have a question about immunotherapy for cancer. There's a lot coming out on immunotherapy. Um, and I think the, the jury is still out. People have anecdotally say, oh, it works great. And others said it didn't do anything. So I think until there's really some peer reviewed literature, um, it's hard to really recommend it. But, you know, I think 